Welcome to week seven of our study of theology. This week, we'll look at the sacraments. To start with, let's take the very word sacrament. It comes from our idea of sacred, or a sacred or holy act. And we've talked about holiness before, that it does mean separateness, but it's separateness in the sense of being special, of being linked to God. So this is a godly act, and indeed, it's a godly ordered act that we'll look at. But St. Augustine defined it as an outward and temporal sign of an inward and enduring grace. So we're going to look both at the physical act of baptism and communion, but we're also going to talk about the spiritual realities behind them. Now, there is an element of this whenever we talk about grace uh, and acts of God, that there's a mystery involved. And in fact, uh, when we talk about these uh, things, St. Augustine used the Greek word mysterion, which is exactly where we get our word mystery from. So a sacrament is also called an ordinance. And an ordinance is just a fancy word for an order. And we see it most explicitly with do this in remembrance of me for communion. Although in the Great Commission, go and teach them to obey all that I have commanded, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there are orders for those. And as we'll see, uh, there are others that are involved in this too. But these are both signs of the covenant. And they talk about a covenant between a king and his people. And the basic covenant is, you will be my people and I will be your God. And so God made these agreements uh, in which uh, we act uh, and accept his grace. And there are signs of the covenant. And that's what baptism and communion are. So Protestants recognize baptism and communion. And indeed, that's where we're going to focus today. Roman Catholics, on the other hand, have seven. So they start with baptism. And then they have confirmation. Now, we're going to talk a lot about confirmation, too, on the reform side. So we believe in the act of confirmation, but they believe that it was something that uh, was ordered by God. Likewise, the idea of penance, uh, and that would be going to confession, and then you do penance afterwards. Uh, anointing of the sick, where we talk about last rites. Although many Protestant churches will take oil and um, put the sign of the cross on people who are sick, uh, because there is uh, a place in the New Testament where that is done. And then marriage. Here's one where we, uh, it's a church ceremony, and we recognize God's presence in it. So we don't call it a sacrament, but it's still a holy act. And then holy orders is an interesting one. This is where certain people are set aside to be priests or nuns. And in particular with the priesthood, referring to those passages in scripture where uh, what is bound on earth uh, will be bound in heaven. And this is what Jesus said to Peter and what, what uh, the Roman Catholic Church believes priests can do. For Protestants, we don't believe that we have the power to bind heaven. However, we do have special ordination ceremonies uh, where people are set apart to uh, serve as pastors and they go through special training and whatnot. And theirs is not a power within themselves or within the office, but rather we believe that uh, God uses special people through their education and through their insight and maturity to lead. So just as uh, God had Moses and then judges, he had uh, the prophets, he had uh, pastors in the New Testament. There are people who are set aside. So we don't see it as a sacrament, but we recognize that there are special offices in the church. And indeed, if we do our eight-week course on the church, uh, we will look at this issue of how churches are governed both divinely and through human agencies. So having looked at this difference, we're going to concentrate on the two that Protestants recognize, starting with baptism. In this, Reformed Protestants see it as the New Testament equivalent of circumcision. So in the Old Testament, circumcision was to be done on the eighth day. And it was a statement of faith that somebody was coming into uh, 
the family of God, where in this case, circumcision being, uh, this is what recognition of the covenant he made with the Jews, and that God chose this person, just as they were part of the chosen people. So we talk about the fact that it's a statement of faith. We have faith that God is doing something. So also it's a declaration that this person belongs in the family of God. And one thing that uh, Reformed Presbyterian, Reformed Protestants do more perhaps than uh, say uh, Baptists is we talk about being cleansed from sin. Uh, they talk about the new life uh, rising up, but we'll explain the difference when we get to the modes of baptism. So as a physical act, it's a statement of faith. It's outward. We physically do it. And it's entry into the church visible. Uh, baptism is supposed to be the start of an adult or a committed relationship with um, the family of God. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, that's God's choosing. It's a gift of grace. It's something that happens within us. And it is a link to the invisible church, the true church, regardless of what happens on the outward signs. Now, this idea of entry into the church is critical. You may remember that we had our, our session where we talked about people who say, I'm saved, I'm done. And that once saved, always saved. So I'm, I'm in and I'm good. Well, no, baptism is not supposed to be the end. It's supposed to be the beginning. And indeed, there's an old joke that says uh, three pastors got together and one was a Roman Catholic priest, one was a Presbyterian minister and was a Baptist minister. Well, they all had nice big churches and they all had steeples and all had bats up in their steeples. And they were talking shop. How do we get rid of these things? And the priest said, well, we ring the bells every day and the bats fly away, but then they come back. And the Protestant the Presbyterian minister said, well, we called it an exterminator. And he went in and he sprayed and everything, and that drove the bats away. But after about a week or so, they came back. And the Baptist minister laughed and says, you guys are missing the boat. We went up to the belfry, we baptized them all, and we haven't seen them since. The idea that when you're baptized, bingo, you're done, gets us back to what I talked about with the big three. People come to the church as a service station to be hatched, matched, and dispatched. And the hatching is the baptism part. Matching is marriage and dispatching is their funerals. So they think it's an act. And once done, I'm done. It's meant to be just the opposite. Just as I'm saved, I've just begun. So baptism is a step forward into relationship. And this needs to be taught. This needs to be explained more because so many people uh, just go through the symbolism of it and they don't recognize what it's to be in terms of the internal uh, spiritual reality of it. So the physical act of baptism does not guarantee salvation. All too many people may think they're saved and they're living a false belief. Also, the idea that uh, I've done it, I'm baptized. Well, baptism is a reflection of God's work in a person. And it also includes the congregation. One of the problems is that a lot of baptisms are done privately, just with a pastor and the person and a couple of people standing around, often just the family. Whereas in the Reformed tradition, it's a part of the regular service. And that is because this idea of coming into uh, God's family, well, family involves mutual relationships and mutual responsibilities. So people who are baptized are to be involved, but those who were already baptized, those who are already members of the church, have their own responsibilities. So there's a charge to the congregation when this is done. And I just picked one off the internet, but it gets at the main point. So it starts out with a statement that our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. And that gets back to the Great Commission. To you, the people of this church, and very often it will be to you, the members of this church, because it's those who are members who have the responsibility. If there are people who are sitting there who have not joined, we're, you're welcome to be here, but you do, have not accepted the responsibilities. Do you, the members of this church, promise to tell this new disciple of the good news of 
uh, the gospel and to help the one I picked was for a, a young girl uh, to help her know all that Christ commands. Hence, Matthew 28. And by your fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. And so it's not, gee, that was a fun ceremony, go away. It's a matter of we are entering into a relationship and we have to work at that relationship, both with the family and with the uh, individual being baptized. All too often we think that church is, well, the minister takes care of it. But if the church is people, it's those interpersonal relationships that count. And the pastor may be one of them, but if, it's, if the pastor is the only one, it's not going to work. We need to have relationships with one another. Now, part of the problem with the sacraments is they've divided the church rather than united it. And we've already talked about the Roman Catholics have seven, Protestants only have two. But within the Protestant denominations, there are splits over two different issues. One is just the mode of how we baptize. There's sprinkling, and then there's baptism by immersion, where the person's actually put under the water and brought up from it. Well, sprinkling uh, is justified in Reformed churches by being linked to the Old Testament and the idea that the blood of sacrifices was sprinkled on the people to cleanse them. And there are references in Hebrews to this. Um, in the New Testament, uh, Baptists tend to say it's immersion. They don't worry about what the Old Testament says. They've got a couple of references in Romans and Colossians that refer to being dead in Christ and rising up with Christ. And so they see the symbolism of going under the water as being dead and rising up to new life. So uh, because it's done for older uh, people who can remember what's going on, uh, and the physical act very often can be very emotional, that they really feel like something special has happened because it's a physical act that reflects um, a change. Whereas it certainly with the baptism of infants, there's no um, adult recollection of what's happened. So in addition to the mode, sprinkling or immersion, we have a question of timing. Uh, sprinkling is typically done with infants. Uh, immersion is typically done with adults. And for Baptists, they will have the parents dedicate their infant, or actually they dedicate themselves to raise this child up. So when the child is an adult, they're baptized. Now, I tend to use the word adult baptism, but in a lot of Baptist churches, you'll hear believer baptism. And that idea that somebody has come forward and says, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And fair enough, except that just saying it doesn't make it true. Every Baptist pastor I've ever talked to has horror stories of uh, a high school boy who wanted to date a girl in the youth group. So he says, oh, I believe just so he can get close to her. Or um, children at four years old saying, I believe because their parents are pushing them and baptizing them when the pastor says, well, I'm not really sure that this person understands what she's saying at that young age. Still an act of faith. We believe this profession of faith, this statement that I believe to be valid, and they almost always go through with it. So the reform position says that the parents can speak for the children, but when those children get old enough, and here reformed uh, churches tend to be more uh, strict about not doing three and four year olds, but waiting until they're in high school or junior high, they're, they're 12 or older. And 12 seems to be an interesting cutoff for a lot of things. For example, in the Jewish faith, that's when you can have a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah for a child to become an adult. Uh, in developmental psychology, they talk about children being 12 or older, getting to the age where they can start to understand abstract concepts like the Trinity, or uh, as we talk about when we get to communion, the spiritual presence of Christ in the elements. And so uh, there, uh, the children are taught something like this, a basic theology course, so that they can say, yes, now that I understand, I personally accept and confirm that God has been at work at me and that I am in, I want to be in an adult relationship with the con others of the congregation. So we're going to look at that in that little table that's in your book here in just a second to show you how they fit together. But uh, 
for baptism, uh, infant baptism, like we said, the Reformed churches link it to circumcision. Uh, Joshua 24, 15, that's where Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that idea that me and my house, uh, he's speaking for the people, he has the right to speak for his house to include the children. And uh, with this idea of adult baptism, um, Baptists tend to rely on New Testament references, particularly the book of Acts. So what we've got, and here's where you can fill in the blanks on your uh, little grid, is the timing. Uh, Baptists speak for themselves. We dedicate this child. But the child has to speak for himself or herself when they are baptized. Say personally, I believe, and that comes back to the Acts thing, said to other adults, repent and be baptized. The Reformed view, on the other hand, says as parents speak for their children, we believe that God is at work in this child. So it's not a matter of personal confirmation. It's a matter of faith that God is at work. And when the children are confirmed, they say, yes, we recognize God's work in our lives, and we are responding to it. Now, I mentioned that children who are baptized as infants have no adult recollection of that. In the theology, they're supposed to go through a confirmation class and really come to grips with what it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, a lot of Protestant churches uh, aren't big on confirmation. Either the children grow up and they leave the church because they didn't go to Sunday school, um, or the churches themselves don't keep track. But confirmation, as an adult confirming of what the, the parents did, really should be a major effort in a church, uh, both to recognize um, what's been done, but to reinforce for these young adults that it's not just a piece of paper that you keep in your folder along with your birth certificate and, and uh, report cards, but rather reinforcing what's done. In fact, baptism at any time should be a time of reflection for those of us who were baptized to say, where is God in our lives and how are we uh, linking up even now within the church and growing as disciples? I mentioned that Baptists rely a lot on Acts, both for the idea of uh, a repent and be baptized and, and that it's a believer baptism. But Acts itself as a book recorded a missionary movement. So we see new churches uh, in Ephesus, uh, or uh, Rome and whatnot, and the preaching of Peter and Paul, repent and be baptized, for people who've never heard the message of Jesus Christ, absolutely. But it's a select group. Acts does not address what happened once churches were established. And so it doesn't look at the issue of children of believers. In fact, in church history, um, children were routinely baptized until the Baptist movement started and then said, no, it's got to be just what we read in Acts, not the church traditions that we've followed. So uh, talking about things like uh, Lydia and this idea that she and her household were uh, baptized. Households would include infants. So this debate about uh, the Bible says it's only adults and believers well, if you're just using Acts, you can make that case. But for the Reformed side, we tend to say, look at the Old Testament links and the idea that you're arguing from silence rather than a true statement that this is the limit of who gets it. The other issue with baptism is, can you be baptized more than once? Well, if you grew up and you were baptized as an infant, then you go to a Baptist church, they'll say, that wasn't a legitimate baptism. You didn't repent and you be baptized. You have to do it now as an adult. So they may say that there's only one baptism, but infant doesn't count. You have to be baptized as an adult. Again, back to uh, the reality. There are people who are baptized more than once, some several times. And this gets a little touchy because if baptism is all about you and how you feel getting it done, being the center of attention and getting to brag that it's been done, then where is God in that? How is God working? Um, but it's hard for, for uh, 
evangelical movements or Baptist churches, if somebody comes in and, and says, I want to be baptized, well, have you already had it? And that raises some interesting issues. For the Reformed Church, it's a little more straightforward. Uh, they're big on Ephesians 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then within the Westminster Confession, the traditional uh, reform statement of faith, chapter 27 says the sacrament of baptism is but once to be administered to any person. So no, you shouldn't be re-baptized. That's not to say that just like sometimes you don't get remarried, but you can have a uh, renewal of your vows and go through a a ceremony where you recommit yourself to one another so you could have a rededication. And some churches will have special services where people rededicate their lives. And no, they're not rebaptized, but on an older and yet more, under, more mature, more understanding level, they rededicate themselves to what it is to be a member of the church, to be a member of the body of Christ. Well, that brings us to communion. And here, everybody agrees, this is the New Testament equivalent of Passover. So the Passover story about uh, getting ready to leave Egypt uh, and the angel of death passing over those who had the blood of the lamb put on the lintel and the doorposts. So uh, being saved from death. And of course, this is also that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because they didn't have time. They were in a rush to get out. They didn't have time for bread to rise. So if you ever do a sample Seder meal, uh, they'll have a lot of symbolism in what the foods are, but they're very careful with this, that there is no leaven even in the house if you're Orthodox. So the word communion itself comes from koinonia, and that means fellowship. And uh, we talked before about how sharing a meal is one of the more intimate forms of fellowship. And that's where we get to uh, some of the other names for communion. Uh, one is Eucharist. EU is for good. So um, charis is a gift, the good gift. And Thanksgiving, that we give thanks for what, what we receive that is good. It's also the Lord's Supper. And it's referred to as his table. So that it's not us doing it. We are representatives of Christ and what he's doing there. And communion is both an act of remembrance and a proclamation. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when you uh, do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So in communion, we have the past, Christ's death on the cross. We have the present that we are celebrating this and renewing our fellowship with him and hope for the future. So we've got our uh, past, present, and future tied up in this one event. Now, the bread is a symbol of life. And often we talk about example of manna from heaven in Exodus. And Christ himself said, this is our his body broken for us. Um, I've got a picture there. These are actually wafers that are produced by a group of nuns in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And they're made with unleavened bread. So that you buy them in rolls and when they're passed out, you can actually use your thumb and fingers to break it uh, before you eat it. And other churches will use um, matzos or uh, salting crackers. But the idea of unleavened bread to reflect the link to the uh, Passover supper. The wine or juice uh, is a symbol of sacrifice. Uh, a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. As he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And that new covenant comes out here. Um, traditionally, it was wine, but some who were uh, troubled by the use of alcohol said, well, no, it's unfermented juice. And there's no evidence biblically that that's the case. And yet juice is a common uh, variation. Although I have to smile at this because uh, in the Reformed churches I go to, you get your tray and there it is, all the grape juice. But in the Air Force, uh, because there are different Protestant denominations, they'll have the grape juice in the big two rows on the outside of these plates, and then they'll have wine on the inside. And after the service, and, and we're cleaning up, I noticed that all the wines have been drunk, and almost all of the grape juices are left behind. So those Protestants who drink wine at their home church 
get to experiment with the other side when they're in an Air Force chapel. Now, having said bread and juice or bread and wine, we need to talk about how those elements are perceived uh, within different churches. Because here too, we have church splits. And one of these is deals with the issue of transubstantiation. Isn't that a nice word, transubstantiation? It's the word when I'm teaching that I actually have people say two or three times so they can get it out correctly. But big as it is, it's actually a pretty simple thing. Tran means across, so transport, to carry something across a distance. And then substance, so a substance that moves across. And what they're talking about is something that's moving from Christ to the elements. And this is what we see in the Roman Catholic theology, that the body and blood or the elements really become the body and blood of Christ. That's why they take such care with those elements. And indeed, uh, they're never thrown out. Uh, anything that's left over, priests or others in the church have to eat because you can't mess up the body and blood of Christ. And they're kept in a safe storage. In fact, if you go into a, a Roman Catholic church and there's a little red light glowing in a chapel or, or near the sanctuary, that means that there are elements that have been blessed and have been transformed, transubstantiated, and they're still being stored. And that's what that little red light means. Well, their justification for this is John 6, where Christ said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And of course, if you read on in John, this caused a lot of problems even then when Christ was speaking, because people said, oh, I'm not a cannibal. I don't want to get involved in this. And indeed, the charge of cannibalism followed the early church for centuries based on this passage. Well, Roman Catholics and uh, Lutherans, among others, still believe that this is to be taken literally, and we don't see it. it. You look at the bread, it still looks like bread. You look at the wine, it still looks and tastes like wine. But there's a miraculous, mysterious uh, event that they really, uh, the substance, the true body and blood of Christ, uh, transfers into these elements. Hence, transubstantiation. Their substance changes from uh, goes across from Christ to these elements. Now, the other position uh, is the Reformed position, and that where we were, where Protestants, for the most part, say that this passage was a metaphor. Jesus at one point says, I am the door. Well, he's not a physical door. It's a metaphor for something. And to say that this really is the blood and uh, body of Christ, well, this is consubstantiation. Not moving across trans, but con with. The blood is Jesus, the, the uh, flesh is Jesus, but the bread and wine become spiritually linked to those. So the bread is still bread, but spiritually, there's a spiritual connection to the body of Christ. The wine, the juice, they remain as they are. They don't mystically change, but there's a spiritual reality, not a physical link to the blood of Christ. Hence, consubstantiation. Now, others go even further. And they say that, you know what? We do this in remembrance of him, but there's no physical or spiritual connection here. It's simply a memorial. So that these elements don't have any mystical link with Christ. By and large, in the Reformed uh, traditions, they go with consubstantiation. That there's a spiritual reality here that we need to reinforce and, and understand. And that's what makes communion a sacrament, a sacred event. Question comes up, how often do we take it? Some say it's so important we should do it daily. And indeed in the Roman Catholic Church, not many people show up, but they do indeed have a daily mass. Other churches, uh, such as Lutherans and Episcopalians, will do it weekly. So every week, the sacrament is at the center of their worship service. And to the extent that they're experiencing something special, they're emphasizing the sacredness of it. Most Reformed churches uh, do it monthly. 
but there are those who argue that it's so special that we should only do it quarterly. So Monday, Thursday, we should have a special service on communion. We have worldwide communion in October, and then we do two more in summer and winter. And the idea of the quarterly is that for these uh, timing, communion isn't tacked on to the end of a service. It's a special service in and of itself. So four times a year, communion is the, the focal point of what we're doing. And that, there they're saying by its rarity, we go out of our way to make it special. Of course, having it on Monday, Thursday, and by the way, Monday comes from mandatum, meaning command, a new command I give you. Um, this uh, Monday, Thursday service uh, can become something very special. And it's where you really get your committed Christians, your committed churchgoers to come out. Uh, but that's when it belongs. All too often, uh, you'll see it done on Easter Sunday. And there really isn't a link there because that's Christ rising from the dead. Although pastors will do it because that's the only time you get your twofers. People will come for a Christmas service and an Easter service. And so we'll get them while we can. But these are the kinds of issues that... Um, there's a rationale for each of these four. Do people really understand where they're coming from and why they do it the way they do? There are a couple of warnings. Uh, the big one is this from 1 Corinthians. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And we ought to examine ourselves and we have to recognize what we're doing. So this argument uh, is used in two ways. One, if you haven't been baptized, if you haven't been brought into the body of Christ, then you shouldn't be taking communion uh, because that follows your commitment to the church. And this is a, a, a sacrament of the church. Secondly, um, many in the Reformed tradition will argue that it's not for children either. And I like this cartoon as a way of, of getting at it. They're serving food and children don't understand the spiritual reality of it. So in many reformed churches, they'll, they'll say, no, wait until you're con confirmed. And we discuss this so you really understand it. Other churches will say, well, since in baptism, uh, infant baptism, you've been brought into the church. You should you could take it even if you don't understand and eventually you'll grow into it. Certainly, I don't know of any pastors who are uh, communion police on this, although in some churches that are more conservative, they will talk about it because they want the people to understand why it's special and why we should wait. And of course, that often is linked then to making confirmation class so special because once you're confirmed, you have your first communion and it's a very significant event. Difference of opinion, uh, all too often, People don't understand the theology and they're going to go with what they want rather than having a sound theological reason for it. Now, the second warning is a little more broad. And this comes from Matthew chapter five, where Christ says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and you've got something against your brother or sister, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled. Now, we have altars in churches and the altar is central to communion. It's a symbol of what we're about to partake. And that's why uh, some churches will have a communion table, but often the elements are put on the altar. They're symbols of Christ's sacrifice on an altar to uh, save us. But what he's talking about here is don't play the game. Don't go through the ritual. Don't expect to be right with God if you're not right with somebody else. And in the Bible, we read, how can you uh, say you love God, but then hate your brother? This idea of relationships isn't just me and God. It's both ways, me and others, plus us and God. And so I've actually counseled people, if you're not right with something, don't play the game. Don't go through communion, but leave it. Now, I'm not sure how many people actually pass the plate without taking. But every now and then, I'll get somebody to come up to me and say, you know, I got a problem and maybe talk with me first before going to be reconciled so that when they come back to communion, Lord, thank you for 
helping me not play a game and that I can really be in good faith with you because I'm in good faith with my brothers and sisters. And that idea of, of spiritual preparation for the communion service. So all too often we just flow with the crowd. Just like if you go to a new church, you rise, you sit in the back so you can rise and fall with the tide. And if the plate's coming by and people are taking the piece of bread, I'll take a piece of bread. What's going on inside? This physical act, what's the spiritual reality that's going on with me? And with that, we end this section on the sacraments. Uh, look forward to having our final session last time on discipleship.